Good afternoon, everybody. I'm Carl Villacoba, and welcome to today's How Tuesday webinar. Today we're going to take a, a tour of the Mid-Atlantic Ocean Data Portal, which is sometimes called the MARCO Portal, which stands for the Mid-Atlantic Regional Council on the Ocean. A little about myself. I'm the Communications Director for the Monmouth University Urban Coast Institute, which is part of the team that's working with MARCO to develop the portal, and we'll get into that more in a few minutes. Um, I know we have users on these webinars that tend to have experience, um, or a, a mix of experience levels. So to start, I'm going to show um, a handful of slides with some brief background about the portal. And then I'll give about a 20-minute tour of what's on the portal and how to use that. And afterward, I'll open it up to questions and discussions on whatever you like. So. If you see something that you have an immediate question about during the demo, definitely feel free to jump in and um, either you know, verbally uh, ask a question or type it into the chat box. Finally, uh, this session is being recorded for the benefit of those who couldn't make it today. And I will post it sometime this week on our webinar page and the portal blog. And I'll show you how to find both of those. So here we go. A lot of people go to the beach, they, they put their chairs in the sand, they look out at a view that is something like this, just this vast uh, watery void, absolutely nothing going on. So peaceful that research has actually shown that this view can be good for your mental health. But the reality is something a bit different. The ocean is really a very busy place, and especially here in the Mid-Atlantic, it's getting busier all the time. <clears throat> You've got um, heavy cargo vessel uh, traffic coming in and out of New York Harbor and Delaware Bay and Virginia. You've got uh, fishing, commercial fishing activity at sea, uh, recreational boating, undersea cables. Um, in, in the near future, you're going to have offshore wind off uh, the coast of the Mid-Atlantic. And what the portal does is help illustrate all of those things um, so that you can tell how they relate with one another and in some cases conflict with one another. And on the basis of that, if you're somebody in a decision-making role, you can make more, better informed and, and smarter decisions based on what you see. <clears throat> so what's on the portal? Currently about 4,000 and soon to be even more, about 5,000 map layers organized under 11 themes. We have some instructional and educational resources for users, including um, a blog, um, a story map that we call Ocean Stories, um, some, an event calendar, and we do um, semi-monthly webinars like this one. And we have some other tools for users to share their maps and collaborate on uh, work in groups. The, the portal team is currently the Monmouth University Urban Coast Institute, where I sit, Rutgers University, the Nature Conservancy, and our developer EcoTrust out of Oregon, working under the guidance of Marco. One of the big things that the portal did was take a lot of data that was scattered in probably several dozen different government um, and uh, nonprofit and, and public private sector um, offices and bring them under one umbrella, really focused on the stuff that matters most to the Mid-Atlantic region. So you have a national level portal called the Marine Cadaster, and we have um, taken some data from that that really, again, applies um, most closely to the Mid-Atlantic. You know, we're not interested in their data about um, Hawaiian whales or something like that. Just really uh, the stuff that matters most to our particular um, region. Um, we also develop a lot of data together in, in partnership with um, the Northeast Portal to the north, which covers nor New England. And we have some state portals in the region that share data with us and vice versa. A couple of examples of how the portal is being used. Offshore wind is obviously a, a very hot topic right now, and especially here in the Mid-Atlantic, there are a lot of different sites under 
um, different levels of um, uh, investigation right now for potential wind farms. And the portal has a lot of data that can help inform those siting decisions and the, the discussions on them, including um, uh, where cargo vessel concentrations are highest so that you can keep them safely out of the way of that. Areas where uh, commercial fishing grounds are um, especially critical so that you're not impacting business, um, and, and all kinds of other things that you, you could uh, examine for safety or economic considerations. Submarine cables are a very uh, big deal here in the Mid-Atlantic. The New York, New Jersey coast has historically been probably America's largest hub for um, uh, overseas communications cables. And now you're seeing a lot of growth in the Virginia Beach region. In, in the last couple of years, there's been um, a few cables that have uh, come out of there for the first time. And so people who are designing the alignments of those routes have consulted the portal to um, help them avoid, say, um, a lot of the naval um, training grounds in that area or uh, bottom tending fishing gear that could get snagged on the lines. We've seen a giant rebound in humpback whales in, in the New York, New Jersey shore area. And while that's very good news, it's also something to be concerned about in that these are basically several ton um, animals that are like children playing in the middle of uh, the largest marine uh, highway, essentially, in, in the mid-Atlantic. And so the portal has been used to help uh, figure out areas where the interactions between whales and large vessels um, can be most frequent. And some studies have been going on about that. And uh, they've helped inform some of the public outreach to help um, boaters understand where they should be especially careful and what they can do. It's also been used in the classroom more and more as um, a tool for marine science education, even from you know middle school to high school students. And part of the reason for that is that although we have all of this great scientific data and it's a sophisticated tool, we really make every effort to make this as simple and usable to any layman and hopefully you'll feel the same when we've run through it. So now let me jump into the actual site. So here is the home page, <clears throat> and you can find it at portal.midatlanticocean.org. And what you see here uh, up, up top is um, a carousel, which you can click through to get a direct link to some of the um, newest stuff that we're working on and some announcements on um, new data and things like that. Up here, where you, click, you can click Map to take you to Marine Planner, which is the main event of the portal, the area where th that actually has the interactive maps, where you can click down here. Um, and before I jump into that, just want to point out a couple of other resources. Uh, under this News Hub, we have this blog. So for a frequent user, you can check in on this. And any time that we add any significant new data sets or tools, um, you can find a, a short article about it here with an explanation of how to use it, how to find it, um, where it came from, and so forth. Ocean Stories is sort of a um, part digital magazine that we have and part story map application. And so you can, for example, click on this one, which is uh, about the, um, re the rebound of whales in the New York, New Jersey area. And scroll down, and what you'll see up top is a data map. And as you scroll down, that map can change to show other data. And the story helps explain the data. And the data map helps basically tell the story. So they're very good educational tools. and. Um, a way to help highlight some of the interesting things going on here in the Mid-Atlantic region. <clears throat> We've got a calendar. Anyone is free to send us um, links to 
events related to ocean planning and things that a portal user um, might um, take an interest in. We've got the data catalog here, which is basically um, a direct entry to um, all of the different data that we have, the descriptions of them. Uh, so for example, renewable energy can go in there and, and see the list of the different data layers that we have. We view ourselves as a public information uh, effort in a, in primarily. So whenever possible, we give um, links here to download the data directly. If you have um, a mapping application of your own in your office that you can use this uh, for. Metadata, um, you can click to find um, a direct link to the source that provided that particular data and some other information. Um, under the help, using the portal, this is something that you might want to check out after this webinar. If a couple of days from now you think to yourself, uh, how did he do that? What, how did he work that tool? You can find um, short little one-minute videos or diagrams and fact sheets and stuff like that, which can help you um, navigate the portal and um, find out some information of some of its, uh, you know, key data sets and, and so forth. <clears throat> also under that heading, there is the webinars uh, um, archive, which has a couple of years worth of specific ones. Some of them are kind of introductory like this one, and other ones are dedicated to specific data sets or topics. Um, and yeah, with that, I think I'll jump into the map. So here is Marine Planner. And by default, it'll put you into a um, uh, ocean base map. But here at the bottom right, you do have some other options. And you can click there for, um, for example, a street map, um, a satellite view, um, a NOAA nautical chart, and all of them can be useful or just easier to help um, look at certain maps depending on their colors in their own way. And to the left here are the dozen or so different themes of information that we have, as I mentioned earlier. And so I'll run through these real quickly and point out some of the um, core data sets that are found within them. Administrative is basically government boundaries and so forth. And what you'll see is the, the name of the map. Um, and you can click on, this is all it takes, it's clicking on um, any of them right there. You can look at them together. You can look at them in combination with one another. You can click here to see a legend. To the left on the, the active tab gives you some options to uh, manipulate the view of it a little bit. So for example, you've got a whole bunch of stuff here. You've got this um, grid pattern at the very top for the OCS lease blocks. <clears throat> you can actually slide that down to the bottom if you want um, and, and bring some other things up further to the top um, to help view things. You can mute a layer or turn it right back on. In the middle, you can adjust the um, opacity to make something darker or um, more transparent. And the X get, lets you get rid of something altogether. To the left, that little green ball that you'll see next to any data layer, this eye icon, um, gives you a little drop down basically with the first couple of lines of text that you would get in that data catalog entry that I showed earlier, <clears throat> along with, again, some direct links to the data downloads, metadata, and source for that. So we'll all go ahead and close out everything there and get back to the data tab. <clears throat> so beneath that, you have phishing, and this is primarily commercial phishing data here, and a few uh, different layers here I'll point out. Artificial reefs is actually one of our most um, active, activated, frequently activated um, layers on the portal. And you can click on any of these um, shapes here 
to get a little bit of an, a pop-up with an ID of what that reef is called. Um, beneath that, two different divisions of commercial fishing data. We have VMS, which is Vessel Monitoring System. This is basically electronic tracking of fishing vessels, and it's by catch type. So you can look here and see <clears throat> scallops, 2015 uh, and 16 data. You click on that, and what you see, almost like a, a TV weather map, where the uh, red, you know, most intense colors signify where um, fishing activity, um, you know, where, where the vessels were um, for the most uh, time. And what you can also do <clears throat> is click these um, less than five knots divisions here of, of the same scallop data from 2015 and 16. And what that does is get rid of the vessel transit uh, portions of that map so that you can basically now get a read on where people were most likely fishing, where the traffic was slower, they're spending more time, whereas that full one shows a lot of um, intensity coming out of the inlets where, you know, they're basically moving very fast and trying to get to a specific area. Beneath that, you have VTR for vessel um, trip reporting. These are filed by um, all of the vessel captains, and we call this also our communities at sea data. An another difference with this is, and we have uh, 20 years worth of this data in five-year windows, so 96 through 2000, 01 through 05, 06 through 10, and so forth. So you can use these to tell how things have changed over time. But these are by uh, gear type. So for example, dredge, you're going to get scallop, but you'll also get um, you know, surf clam and, and maybe some other fisheries. You can click on anywhere on the map, and this is why we call it communities at sea, because when you do click on there, you get this list of the communities that depend on this particular area at sea. And so uh, you see here this area, Barnegat, New Jersey, Cape May, Massachusetts, Montauk, New York, um, Virginia, and so on. Let's say you were um, a, an agency in a public, uh, in an ocean management role and you were going to make a decision that impacts this area and needed to do some public outreach, you would know that you would want to reach out to people in Barnegat and Montauk and all of these other places to let them um, know what's happening, for example. You can also click on the different ports for a pop-up with information about the total number of trips that, that originated out of that port, uh, the percentage of the, the regional total, total fisher days, um, which is calculated by the number of people on each vessel over that full amount of time, and some other information. So it's a pretty cool and unique tool that we have here. <clears throat> Moving on, and uh, I'll just close these out. We have fishing communities at sea by port. So this is basically all of that same data, but broken down to show just specific places. So for example, let's say uh, you were again interested in dredge, but you only wanted to know about Barnegat. You would type that name in there, and it would give you this map of just that place. And what it shows is um, not where 90% of that port's fishing effort took place. Okay, beneath this, marine life. So we, uh, we have two different category or themes of marine life here. And kind of like the fishing um, uh, communities at sea and, and VTR um, divisions, one is dedicated to basically full larger groups, and the other one is dedicated to specific uh, species. So it's just one is more specific and the other one's the, the, the broader data set. <clears throat> so 
under here you can say you can see for example we've got bird data fish data marine mammal and for this you can find you know where all cetaceans um, are concentrated um, or you can look at something like say abundance of um, baleen whales and get a legend for that showing you know where it's high and low but you can also click under here for marine mammal abundance and search for just humpback say and what you see is after you've typed in about two uh, I think two letters you start getting a full list of any data set available in there that um, would match that title so we have um, the humpbacks in this case for every month so June where are they right now and you can see and um, compare them from month to month to get a sense of um, where they are at different times of year but going back up to the marine mammal groups um, some other big ones in here um, uh, highly migratory species so that's another one that you can click on to get a pop-up and it tells you basically a, a full list of different sharks and swordfish and tuna and it gives you just a yes or no of whether or not um, that's an area where they um, rely on as a habitat and, and um, The legend will show by color where um, you know the, the areas are most uh, the highest concentrations. And you can see sea turtles, sea grasses, and some other ones. Maritime is essentially um, vessel traffic and human industrial kinds of activities. The most important and most widely used uh, data within this theme would be the AIS vessel transit count data <clears throat> so what this is um, is like the fishing VMS it's electronic tracking of vessels and in this case different vessel types so you can click on all to see every kind of vessel that carries an AIS transponder and see um, where the most vessels were counted for those years but you can also click to uh, whittle that down to just one kind of vessel type so for example cargo fishing vessel um, tug and toes and um, give that a second to load here you'll see that we have that for several years going back to 2011 and up to 2017 currently and soon to add 2018 we also have a couple of these AIS monthly data sliders so what we did here was take the monthly data for the year and create these animations um, and, and, and this toggle tool which allows you to either manually go through month by month or um, just click the button to animate it automatically and this is just a, a very heavy amount of data to load at once so you got to be patient with it it sometimes takes about uh, 20 seconds to fully load But on the second line you've got um, all you've got the different divisions cargo passenger tankers um, tug and tow pleasure and sailing and so forth and um, you know it's taking a bit of time here but let's see what happens we're trying to animate it all right now it's filling out anyway don't want to hold up too much time on that but that's how you do use it also in the maritime theme you've got um, a lot of 
information about ports, a lot of information about um, uh, submarine cable locations, um, ocean disposal sites, whether they're active or closed. Uh, you can click on any of them to find out um, a little about the history of that. We have um, wrecks and obstructions, another uh, really cool layer. You can kind of get lost in this. Click on any of the icons and it'll give you um, some information, if available, about specifically what is down there. Um, the vessel name, when it was found, um, if it was sunk by a torpedo or something like that, coordinates. Beneath that, oceanography, so some data pertaining to the phys physical characteristics of the ocean, the ocean bottom. Um, some of the stuff we have here, bathymetry is pretty popular. Um, some, a lot of this stuff is new. Uh, and what you can see, zooming out a bit, is a pretty full picture of what's on the ocean floor from basically a shoreline right on out to uh, well deep into the mid-Atlantic. And there's some different options for that in that bathymetry dropdown. Also some stuff about fronts, um, areas where ocean acidification is being monitored, and by what different um, equipment type, whether or not it's ongoing or if it was a one-time thing. Under recreation, we have some data taken through surveys and from talking to people, asking them where they spent their time um, boating, for example, and, and what they did. So here's, here's one where we did that, fishing, relaxing, scenic enjoyment, wildlife viewing. Um, we did another one in partnership with the Surfrider Foundation, uh, Coastal Recreation Survey. So we asked people where they like to, for example, shore-based activities, basically were beach hotspots. So you zoom in on there and you can see that, you know, the reds are uh, areas that people, um, did the most activities um, and other ones where they did fewer. You've got also under there um, underwater activities like scuba diving, places that are good for surface water activities like surfing, bodyboarding, skimboarding, etc. We have renewable energy, a very important topic. So a different, a couple of different um, ways of looking at it. The BOEM Federal Renewable Energy Lease Areas are on here, and the planning areas are on here. We have um, some different ones like uh, New York State's Wind Energy Area of Consideration that they uh, initially proposed. Um, so all of this can be found and compared to other data sets in the Mid-Atlantic, and we're seeing that used a lot with um, the public outreach, especially that, that BOEM has been doing, and uh, users have been creating some of their own maps and submitting them in their public comments or um, making observations at public meetings based on things that they've seen. So um, it's pretty neat to see uh, the portal being used more and more for um, all kinds of different uh, uses. Beneath that, we have security. So a lot of this is basically declassified information provided by the Navy, including danger zones and restricted areas, so places where you're not allowed to go as a boater or sometimes might not um, be allowed to go. And you can click on any of those areas for an explanation about what you're seeing. You've got stuff like um, um, unexploded bomb locations either areas where um, um, unexploded munitions were dumped after World War II or something like that, or places where just one or two specific um, torpedoes or something like that were found. And those are pretty important to know about. And finally, 
socioeconomic. Not a whole lot here. We're about to add some more uh, information, but we have population density in um, watersheds. And we have also here ocean economics GDP, which was taken from NOAA's ENO database. So this is kind of cool. You can, you can click on any coastal county <clears throat> and get a pop-up that tells you how many jobs in that county were directly dependent on the ocean, um, wages, GDP, how many different businesses are directly dependent on the ocean. And then there's a link for um, more information directly at NOAA's ENAL Explorer database. So um, moving on, just want to show you some different tools that we have available. Uh, top right, we've got a, a row of buttons, a print and export button. We have a share this map button, which gives you the option to get a short URL or an, an embed map. If you have your own website and want to just put um, a window with one of the, the portals maps in there. We have this line measurement tool. So um, this is a, actually something that we just came out with a couple of weeks ago uh, after many requests and popular demand. So very easy to use. You click on that. Let's say you want to get um, an approximate distance from shore to something like this uh, wind lease area. And you'd see under there it says um, about 20 miles, but then you can add up other segments. Double click it to finish it. We have beneath that, actually this is something if you, um, you have to be a registered portal user to access this one. <clears throat> and this is, that's free and very easy to do. Just go to, um, in the top right, if you're not logged in, uh, you'll find an option to um, sign up. You just need an email, um, totally free, and it just unlocks a couple of tools like this where um, basically if there's any different ArcRest uh, GIS map layer out there that's published and you have the URL for it, you can essentially import it into the portal for a one-time use. Um, and that can be anything, ocean data, um, land use data, uh, transportation planning data, anything. And, and again, um, compare all of the different things on the portal with that data which is important to you. Um, down in the bottom right, another easy way to get in and out. Um, we've got this ticker here with the latitude and longitude of wherever the uh, cursor is pointing. And beneath that, provide feedback if you ever find a layer is not working or <clears throat> you have a question or want to provide some other feedback, this will just queue up um, an automatic form which allows you to quickly send that message. And I promise you I check that um, and I'll get back to you very quickly on it. Um, finally, un under this My Planner tab, this gives you some additional tools if you want to create a bookmark, let's say. Um, so we want to show, for example, I've got this wind area here, and you want to compare that with um, something like, um, um, we'll say, the latest um, tanker vessel traffic for that year. And I want to make that a little darker so it's easier to see. Let's say you want to share this, this map, save it. You'd go to My Planner, View Map Bookmarks. You click New. Bookmark name, we'll call it um, Tankers and uh, New York Wind. You could type in the description here a couple of sentences if, if you want to. Add bookmark. So now let's say I'm coming totally cold into uh, the portal for the first time of the day and want to find that. I've got a huge long list of bookmarks here. All I'd have to do is click on that, and there it is. It, it even goes straight to um, a specific area where you're zoomed in. The sprocket to the right gives you some options to share it. Um, you can either get 
the URL for it, or you can share it into a portal group. So, for example, um, let's say I'll just pick one for this one one time. Um, Hudson Canyon. That's one group that I've joined. I click share, and now. I'd go to the Hudson Canyon group, and you'd find it listed right there under drawings. And that means anyone who's joined this group would have access to it. And so these groups are another interesting thing to help collaborate on stuff. Let's say that your office is working together on um, some kind of a project that you'd like to share a lot of maps. This is one way where you can just start a group if you're a registered user, um, share your maps to that, your bookmarks, and then you wouldn't have to email all of these things back and forth. You just have them there. And going back to Marine Planner, you can do the same thing with the second category, Drawings, New, Draw Shape. You would have that there. Um, you can also edit it later, but going back next, um, you'd give it a name, give it a description, whatever it is, save it, and you can share it to the groups. And you can actually uh, download it if you wanted to use it for your own GIS mapping software. So a uh, pretty neat tool, and we have a few of them. So with that, it's about 2.40, and I've been talking a lot. And um, why don't I stop here and open it up to any questions that you've got. And Feel free to, if you're on the phone line, um, just say them um, or type them into the chat box, and uh, I'll take them like that. And just okay, we have a question here from Jose Troncoso. Are certain layers taken from public sources and others created in-house? Yes, thank you for that. Um, a lot of our data um, is taken from you know, various government agencies, especially NOAA and BOEM, are, are great uh, data providers. And through the Marine Cadaster, um, we've taken some pretty important core data sets um, from them. But yes, we have created, really, the, the majority of our data um, has been created in-house or in partnership with um, other partners like the Northeast Portal team. Um, for example, all of that marine life data. I mentioned that we have something like <clears throat> 4,000 different, four to 5,000 different data layers on the portal in, in total, and a good three to 4,000 of those are um, straight from the Marine Life Library, which was created in, in partnership with the Northeast and, um, and also um, uh, NOAA. So, um, that would be one way. And, and another, uh, we, we do get some uh, public, or I, I should say private sector contributions too, especially in the area of undersea cables. Uh, our NASCA undersea cables map was provided by the organization NASCA, which is basically um, an organization that represents the different telecom companies. And uh, we have a cable developer right now who um, is giving us some data for new lines that have been laid or are in process of, of being um, laid in the Mid-Atlantic um, that are, you know, owned by um, uh, private ownership. And uh, your second part of that question was, or are they all from public sources? So hopefully I, I did just answer that. And I, I should also mention the, the nonprofits that have chipped in, including um, the Nature Conservancy has done a lot of data development, and they are part of our team. Um, also, uh, that recreational data, like I said, some of that was developed um, through surveys in partnership with the Surfrider Foundation. Is there cable info as well? I clicked on some of the cables, but there was no pop-up. So that's a good question. Um, let me share my screen again. 
So under the cables here, and you'll find the Nazca submarine cables, you really have to zoom in pretty close, and it'll start giving you the names of different cables. Um, I should mention that uh, as you zoom in, they start to look different from afar. They're all, you know, the solid lines, and then you get the dotted lines. Basically, the dotted lines are out-of-service um, lines, older ones, and the squiggly lines are the ones that are live, but um, they were given to us in this squiggly format just to basically protect their um, positions a little bit so that people don't know the exact spot, but they, they know generally where they are. Um, in the very near future, we're going to be adding a couple of cable layers. One is going to be provided from NOAA, and it shows a lot of the stuff that's on the nautical chart that we don't have represented um, from NASCA, and you can see them you know, here in their own squiggly kind of way. And some of them are even power lines that are connecting from, um, you know, an island to an area on land or something like that. Um, and we're also going to be adding, like I said, a, another layer of more recent cables, especially um, ones that have come in through Virginia Beach and the Jersey Shore that, um, weren't there at the time when um, the NASCA data was first provided to us. Um, and right now, you know, there, there are a lot of cables still being built because people need high-speed internet connections from America to places in Europe, places in South America, and um, so on. It's, it's still, even in this wireless world, a very critical um, infrastructure type. No problem, Jose. Anyone else on the webinar have a question or a comment? Um, hello, can you hear us? Yes, I can. Okay, sorry. We had my name's Winfrey. We had some technical trouble, so I had to call in but we're trying to get it to reload, uh, so I can't see your screen. But um, I was curious, did you touch on how often the data is updated? I know it's probably different for each data source, but I know you mentioned something about you can see on the blog some new, like, new sources added, but is there some way to get um, updates also emailed, like when a data source is added? Yes, you can, and, and, and thank you very much for that question. Um, you had it right. The data... Um, is updated at different frequencies depending on, um, you know, the, the type of data. So, for example, we have some of those commercial fishing data sets basically on a program where they're every couple of years um, as we've gathered that data. We have the AIS vessel um, transit counts data, which we're trying to do every year moving forward. And then there's other ones which... Don't up, you know, there's just not a whole lot that changes in frequency from um, year to year, so they're, they're more periodic. But um, as you mentioned, the blog is a good place to keep tabs on what's new and what's on the way. But we have also um, a newsletter, uh, a, a digital newsletter basically that you can sign up for, and I promise we won't bombard you with a whole lot of uh email or anything. It's something that comes out maybe once every other month, and they're generally timed before a new um, webinar is coming to help promote that. But on that email, it'll have <clears throat> direct links to, um, say, you know, the new entries in the blog or um, what, whatever else uh, we have in terms of resources to help you um, understand uh, what came out and how to use it and all of that. Um, so, to get that, you can um, uh, sign up 
for if you're a registered portal user, we automatically will add you to that list. Or you can email us, and um, if you look at the footer of the portal page here, um, right at the very bottom, portal at midatlanticocean.org is the email. You can send it to us there. And another uh, alternative way of, of keeping tabs on things is the portal's Twitter account. And so basically, um, you know, we tend to highlight whatever is new um, with that feed. And um, yeah, so that, that's a good resource and uh, something you can keep an eye on as well. Great, thank you. Thank you. Any other questions or thoughts? Have you used it before? Uh, yeah, I've used it before, um, but not like a, I'm not, I wouldn't call myself a frequent user or advanced user or anything, but um, we have, I work for the Bureau of Ocean Energy Management, and so we also have, you know, a mapping tool, and then there's also um, ongoing contracts. I was just curious about data collection, especially, particularly off the Mid-Atlantic area. Yeah, right. So uh, obviously BOEM is a, a, a very, very important um, data sharing partner. We have SAN data, um, including, you know, some of the, the stuff that just came out um, and, um, you know, continue to work very closely with uh, people over there to um, keep up tabs, keep tabs on, on what they have coming out and how it could be useful for the Mid-Atlantic. Yeah, um, I'm an economist, and so um, I'm particularly interested in what you're going to build out for the socioeconomic section. And then we also lean on um, the on NOAA's eNow data as well. So um, having that visualization is mm -hmm. um, helpful. Well, I can tell you that one source for that socioeconomic data, which is on the way, um, if you go to the Marco website, which is midatlanticocean.org, so basically the same URL but just getting rid of portal dot, there is um, on the site, and I'm, I'm sharing the screen for those who are looking, um, under resources, Um, a, a report here that says climate change vulnerabilities in the coastal mid-Atlantic region. And this was something like a 150, 200 page report that came out last year that has a lot of different maps related to um, economic activity and, and the importance of the ocean in the mid-Atlantic. <clears throat> Some of them are not really very applicable and useful for ocean planning purposes, but there are some that may be. And, um, you know, there, there's a whole lot of maps that were created in this report, and we have the data um, for those maps and are now kind of whittling them down into a final few that we think would be um, the best fit for the portal. So you'll be seeing them this summer. What was the source of that, um, that data? Okay, so if you go to midatlanticocean.org, and that's uh -huh. Marco's website, and at the very top, there is um, a tab up there that says resources. And if you scroll down a little bit, it says there, there's a heading climate change adaptation, and the very first bullet there is a link to um, the full report, and that came out of a, I believe it was a two-year study that took place in the Mid-Atlantic that looked at um, basically climate change issues, ocean acidification, um, uh, basic fish migrations that are happening due to changing sea temperatures and some other things along those lines. But there's a lot of great basic data in their um, economic information about the importance of the ocean to the region. That's the 2015 report? E, let me see. Okay. 
Sorry, I went a different path. It was like on the home page. There it's was a link. May 2018. It was. It stayed. Oh, okay. That was what, so it's a different one, what I found. Okay. Yep. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else have a question? Sorry, this is Jose. I ended up dialing in. Uh, Great. <laughs> the, uh, always, always easier uh, to just uh, talk, especially in a small group. <laughs> um, but I guess my uh, my main question: we have a obviously a, a much more watered down version of a portal like this um, in house. But is this every um, ESRI based then, or is this your own? No, um, our back end is actually uh, open layers. Okay. And um, you know, actually, we built it a few years ago, so it's on. A bit of an older version than our developer has um, done some real magic in terms of um, coding and everything to help create new tools for it and everything. But we do plan uh, sometime in the near future, hopefully, uh, finances depending to um, update that to either the newer, newest layer, uh, I'm sorry, version of open layers or explore other options. And um, that's, that's a big decision that will be coming, um, you know, in the near future. But for right now, it, it is on open layers. I mean, is there an advantage? I know some things were taking a while to load, but in general, it seems like most things are pretty quick. Um, you know, yeah, you know, it, it, there are advantages, or there were, to it when it was first built. You know, the, the, the portal... The original portal goes back to, you know, what, I, what you might call Portal 1.0, goes back to, I think, around 2011. And it was actually started by the state of Virginia. Um, and very quickly, uh, the different states in the region realized that this would be a, a great asset if it were, if it were built out to, um, you know, include the full region because things that happen in one state in the ocean, you know, can make a, a, a very big difference in, in any state. Fish don't know where one, you know, state boundary begins and the other one ends or anything like that. Um, so uh, anyway, the portal continued to build and then it was relaunched in 2015 um, with the new back end and the new front end. It was completely redesigned. Um, so now it's 2019, and you know, so we're talking four, five years later, and with the internet, that's pretty much an eternity. Um, so you know, some of the advantages that were great for it back then may not hold true now, and uh, those are just things that we're going to have to take a lot of stock in and, and have some big discussions on in the near future. And layers in general, I mean, SED can download certain things, but they're not necessarily public in the sense that if I had an S3 portal, I could look it up and import it from there. Mm -hmm. that... Well, in, in, in our case, we try to make everything um, downloadable uh, and, and, and shareable to the extent that we can. There are some data sets that, are, that have some privacy considerations to them like um, the commercial fishing stuff, we don't, you know, there, there's some sensitivity about being able to identify specific vessels and stuff like that. So when, whenever we can, we try to make um, information easily accessible um, and publicly downloadable and, and all of that. Um, sometimes we can't, or sometimes there just needs to be uh, a permission process that uh, people have to go through and um, all depends on the, the different kinds of data. Thank you. Yeah, that's a very impressive portal for sure. So. Thank you. And uh, have you used it much? No, I mean, uh, a colleague of mine, they're, um, we're actually, <laughs> our part of the business, we're into submarine, uh, subsea cables. Mm -hmm. um, so that's why my questions were more targeted around that. We, uh, we are a consult consultancy firm that uh, we do project management and project development for submarine cables. Um, but our sister company, they do more of the environmental part of things. So they're the ones that showed me the portal. Um, they, they came across it and, you know, they put me, they, they sent me the invite for the for this uh, meeting and all that. So uh, this is, yeah, I'm just 
starting to use it right now. Well, that's great to hear. And where are you based? We're in uh, Florida. Florida, okay. There's a, there's a lot of cables down in Florida, too. I mean, if you look at that map, you see basically very, very heavy in New York, uh, um, New Jersey. Um, now you see some in Virginia Beach, and then it basically goes quiet all the way down to about central Florida. And um, there's a lot there, I, I guess, easy access to um, the islands and South America and other places. Yeah, it's kind of crazy with the internet. I mean, a lot of the communication between uh, Latin American countries, not to get too, too far off topic here, but actually they, it goes through Miami mm -hmm. because uh, there isn't a direct connection between them. So it's, yeah, Miami is kind of like the, the, the telecommunication hub for South America. Yeah, you can see that pretty clearly on this map. Um, you know, I, I should mention that our chief focus here is mid-Atlantic data, but there there is a lot of data that we um, have that extends beyond that reach and in some cases goes all the way up and down the East Coast. This NASCA data is national, so this is one layer where you actually have some stuff here, even um, if you're seeing my screen on Pacific Coast, but yeah, if you look down there, you see uh, it, it's very thick coming out of the Miami area, and a lot of it is heading straight south. Mm -hmm. and then other ones are going straight out to you know, Puerto Rico and um, places like that. Well, now, but yeah, no, I'll definitely start using it more now that uh, I know you guys have so much information stored in there. So. Great. And, and always feel free to uh, email us. And if, if you have any questions, and we're happy to um, help, you know, if you ever need an individual call for something, uh, to walk through something, we're, we're, we're always happy to do that. Great. I appreciate that. No problem. All right, so we're coming up on 3 o'clock here. Do we have any further questions? Everybody's gone. <laughs> okay. All right. With that, uh, thank you for coming. And um, as I